Welcome to Understanding Islam, Series 3, Building a Just Society. This week we're looking at education for the sake of God and for the sake of humanity. The Quran on many times tells us to ponder and think on these things. There are signs for those who reflect. In fact, the word signs, ayah, appears more than 200 times in the Quran in total. So pondering and thinking and reflecting is an essential part of Islamic life. Just to read the Quran itself requires education and therefore we can see that education has always been something which is central in the life of Islam from the time of Muhammad onwards. We know that after the Battle of Badr, which was in 634, there were prisoners from the people of Mecca, and the Prophet allowed them to earn their ransom by teaching Muslims from Medina how to read and write. We know that the Prophet appointed scribes so that they would write down the Quran from his lips. We know that he sent treaties and letters to the different communities and the rulers of the people of the earth at this time. We know that when the Prophet was wanting to send a governor down to Yemen on the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, he called the person to him and he said, I'm thinking of sending you to Yemen. On what will you base your guidance to the people? And he answered, on the book of God. Very good, said the prophet. And then, on your example, messenger of God. Excellent, said the prophet. And then, and then the man replied, and then I'll use my own reason. And the prophet replied, you have given an answer that pleases God and his prophet. And the man got the job. So therefore, the use of reason is a hugely important part of living a Muslim life. All knowledge comes from God. It enables the human being to live a godly life. It enables us to learn the ways of God and to implement them in society. Therefore, we can say knowledge is a gift from God to promote human flourishing and to lead human beings on the path toward paradise. And on many occasions, the prophet spoke about knowledge, seeking knowledge, education, teaching and learning. So I want to share with you some of these hadith or sayings of the Prophet that speak about the importance of education. The first hadith that I want to share with you speaks about acquiring knowledge. The Prophet says this, Acquire knowledge. It enables the possessor to distinguish right from wrong. It lights the path to heaven. It is your friend in the desert, your society in solitude, and your companion when you are friendless. It guides you to happiness. It sustains you against adversity. It is an ornament amongst friends and an armour against the enemy. Now we have some crucial elements of this teaching. It enables the possessor to distinguish right from wrong. So education is not just about acquiring any knowledge, it is acquiring knowledge between what is right and what is wrong according to God's guidance. Human beings are to seek what is right 
and thus to discern and avoid that which is wrong. It lights the path to heaven. It is a guide through this life toward the life of paradise. This means that Islamic teaching emphasizes learning good knowledge, which will lead you toward paradise, toward understanding more of the ways of God, and avoiding that knowledge which will debase or degrade the human being. So we shouldn't be spending our time acquiring knowledge which is not to the benefit of human beings. There are two more hadith that I want to share with you that speak as well about the universality of knowledge. The search for knowledge, the Prophet says, is compulsory for every Muslim male and every Muslim female. So we see there is no gender distinction here. This applies equally to all men and women. Both have a right to knowledge. Both also have the duty to acquire it. And then again, the prophet at another time says, Wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he has a right to it. So pick it up. It is yours. Wherever you find it, it is there to ennoble and enrich the human condition. This means that there is no distinction in the Islamic understanding between what we might call secular knowledge and religious knowledge. All knowledge which builds up the human condition, which ennobles the human being, is good knowledge. There is a distinction between good knowledge and bad knowledge. Knowledge that leads toward God and knowledge that takes you away from God. But there isn't a distinction between secular and religious knowledge. This means that the scientist working to push back the frontiers of scientific understanding is as much in the service of God, seeking to unpack the guidance of God, as the theologian, for example, who is working with the revealed text and with the guidance of the prophet. In the next hadith that I want to share with you, we have the prophet speaking of modeling your life on particular sorts of human beings. The prophet says, do not be like anyone except in two cases. The first is a person to whom God has given wealth and who spends it righteously. The second is the one to whom God has given wisdom and who acts according to it and teaches it to others. This is the one that one should seek to emulate. And notice there are three parts here to this sentence. The one who has been given wisdom, who has acquired it, the one who acts upon it, and who teaches it to others. Now, this relationship between knowing something and putting it into practice is central in Islamic understanding. The teacher should be one who has integrated the teaching into her or his life, so that we should see the teaching lived out when we look at the life of the teacher. Therefore, it's perfectly acceptable in Islamic understanding for the student to say, how do you expect me to believe the teaching that you give if I don't see you struggling to live it out in your own life? If you truly believe that this is godly wisdom, then surely we would see you struggling to put it into practice. So the teacher becomes the living embodiment of the message, just as the prophet is the living embodiment of the guidance of the Quran. And so that relationship between knowing something and doing it is essential in the Islamic understanding of education. God is the possessor of all knowledge. Two of the names by which God is known are 
Al-Alim and Al-Hakim. Al-Alim, the all-knowing. Al-Hakim, the wise one. Now, all knowledge is from God, and therefore we can say that searching for knowledge is an act of worship of God because it takes us into that relationship with the divine human dynamic. We can say, in fact, that all our knowledge is unpacking and exploring the attributes of God. It tells us something more about God, Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. Now, God is by definition infinite. Therefore, the progression of the human being in seeking knowledge of the infinite is necessarily a lifelong process, not only in this life, but also in the life of paradise. And so one of the models that we have for the life of paradise is an ever-increasing depth of knowledge of wisdom and of piety coming ever closer to the infinite God and of course one can never reach infinity so there's always something more to explore again we have two hadith of the prophet which help to make this clear in one he says search for knowledge even though it be in China Go to the far ends of the earth in search of knowledge. And again, it is a lifelong quest. The prophet says, A believer will never be satisfied with the good that he hears until he reaches paradise. All through one's life, one must be seeking to acquire fresh knowledge and fresh insight. The prophet himself speaks of himself as a teacher and he gives us an understanding of the importance of seeking knowledge and teaching it in the life of the Muslim community. Listen to this account when the Prophet enters into the mosque. The, pro the Prophet entered into the mosque and people were sitting in groups. There were two groups. Both of them are doing good, he said, but one of them is better than the other. As for these, they call upon God and pray to him for help. If he wills, he gives it to them, and if he wills, he denies it to them. As for these, the other group, they learn theology or knowledge and teach them to the illiterate. They therefore are better. Indeed, I have been sent as a teacher. And then he took his place with that group. And so we see that the search for knowledge, acquiring it and teaching it to others, has a priority over the, the excess devotion of people. Now we know that every Muslim man and woman is required, is obliged, to pray the formal prayer, the Salah, five times each day. But then, what about additional devotion and additional prayer? Again, we have some more Hadith of the Prophet here that help us to understand. Studying together, he says, studying together for an hour during the night is better than spending the whole night in devotions. And again, the superiority of the learned man over the devout man is like that of the moon when it is full by comparison with the other stars. Why is that? Why is knowledge so important for the human being? and for human society. Well, again, we have two hadith which help to illustrate this. Muhammad said, to the devil, a learned theologian is stronger 
than a thousand pious worshippers. And again, a famous hadith, the ink of the scholars is higher in merit than the blood of the martyrs. And so we see the way in which knowledge, acquiring it and teaching it to others, becomes an essential backbone of the Muslim community. It becomes a defense against evil. It becomes a spur to ever greater seeking and knowledge. And therefore, education is the lifeblood of the Muslim community. What about scholarship within the Muslim community after the time of the Prophet? Well, for the Shia, of course, there are the divinely appointed Imams who are par excellence, the guiders of the community. They are the ones who are the bearers of knowledge from God, the light which illuminates and guides them so that they can correctly interpret the Quran and interpret the way in which Muslim life should be lived. But in general, amongst all Muslim schools, there is a very particular point given to the learned ones, those who are scholars. The learned ones, we are told, are the heirs of the Prophet. Those who inherit from them inherit a great wisdom. Therefore, scholars, ulama, have always had a high place within the Muslim community because they are the ones who hand on the teaching from one generation to the next. The way in which these scholars operated is that they would acquire knowledge themselves and then they would pass it on and teach the next generation. When they are convinced that their students have mastered a particular discipline, they would then give them a written certificate to say that they were fit in turn to teach. This ijaza, as it was called, was the equivalent of a contemporary teacher's license or a degree saying this person has mastered this discipline and is a suitable person to go on and teach. Now we have the general term for a scholar, an alim, and the plural ulama, but we also have certain people who are scholars of such high value, such high respect within the Muslim society that their scholarship goes on through generations. This occurs both in the Sunni and in the Shia tradition, and again the word imam is used. Now, important to remember, this is not the divinely appointed imam of the Shia tradition, but imam meaning a scholar of the highest order whose teaching passes on through the generations. So within the Sunni schools, we would have Imam al-Ghazali, for example, Imam ibn Taymiyyah. In the Shia schools, two contemporary scholars were given the title of imam, we had Imam al-Khoy in Iraq and Imam al-Khomeini in Iran. So, scholars of the highest order. But at all times within the Shia community, there are those scholars who are called Grand Ayatollahs or those who are Marjas, and the Marja is one of the highest level of scholarship and piety whose teachings other people can take and follow. They are worthy of emulation, we say. They accept the responsibility that other people will take and act upon their guidance. Now, in the Sunni schools, this system is not so formalized. But there will be Muslims within the Sunni schools who will say, I belong to a school of a certain center of learning. I follow their teachings. I follow the scholars of that particular school. And so we can see that theological traditions are built up 
within the Sunni schools that enable people to identify with those teachers and say, I can rely on their teaching. Over history, the scholars of Islam have created institutions. We can think immediately of the oldest university that we know of in the Western world, the University of Al-Azhar in Cairo, that was founded in the year 978. But in more recent times, the great seminary of Deoband in India has become one of the leading centers of Sunni scholarship in the world. It was founded in 1867. But there are now thousands of affiliates all over the world that have been founded from that seminary. In the Shia tradition as well, the centers of Najaf and of Qum have become great centers of Shia learning and people from all over the world will study there, will travel in search of knowledge. And we can find people from many different nationalities who will be living in those cities. Now, in the 20th century, some of those universities, like Al-Azhar and Qum, have taken on a, a much wider field of disciplines so that they will teach all the disciplines of a modern university. Other schools, like that of Deoband, have really concentrated on the religious sciences. There are three terms which are widely used for these centers of learning within the Muslim practice. The word Jamia, sometimes we translate as university, Dar al the house of studies, and the word Madrasa. Madrasa is perhaps the most widely used, and it can have many meanings. It can go all the way from being a school for small children to being a center for higher studies. When every human being is born, we are born into a natural relationship with God, within ourselves, and within the rest of creation. This natural state of the human being is called the Deen al-Fitra. That is, we are on a path that will keep us in a relationship with God. But obviously, as we grow, as our knowledge expands, as we have new experiences, we need to keep that relationship moving and alive throughout the whole of our life so that we remain in a relationship with God. This means then that education is a lifelong process and it means that education should affect the, the manners, the, the way of conduct of the whole of human life. So the prophet is reported to have said on one occasion, no parents gave their child a better gift than beautiful manners. So right from the beginning of a child's life, parents will be instructing that child in living a good, mannerly, decent, organized life. Not only instructing, but also living out the teaching by example. So we have this relationship again between possessing the knowledge and putting it into practice. So by instruction and example, the parents become the first teachers of every child. As soon as a child is able to start talking and making sense, parents will teach it to say, Bismillah, in the name of God so that they can then start to train the child in this conscious relationship with God in which every action is committed in the service of God. Then as the child gets a little bit older and can start to memorize things, then verses from the Quran will be taught to the child, the child will memorize them. Indeed, in traditional societies, Memorizing the Quran was the first stage in education. Before reading and writing, one would memorize it by listening to somebody 
and then learning it and committing it into the heart. In societies where Arabic isn't the common language, the mother tongue of the people, it will then be done phonetically through listening and some people will learn how to sound out the message of the Quran by looking at the script just by knowing how it sounds rather than being able to deconstruct the language. Every Muslim, male and female, needs some verses of the Quran in their memory in order to be able to pray. Because during the prayer, one must recite from memory verses of the Quran. Therefore, everyone learns some. Some people will try to learn one thirtieth part of the Quran, for example. And then there will always be some people who go further and try to commit the whole of the Quran into memory. This is the first step of education. Of course, schooling becomes very important within the life of a Muslim community, but schooling must never be divorced from a moral framework. So there must be the learning of good and productive information and knowledge, but also we must learn it within a framework that promotes an integrated Muslim life. This means that especially as children get older, Muslims will prefer single-sex schools so that boys and girls to learn, can learn together in a moral framework without being distracted by other thoughts. The role of a Muslim teacher is very important. Students will be taught to respect their teachers and teachers become role models to their pupils so that the way that the teacher conducts herself in the classroom, the way in which the teaching can be seen in practice becomes an essential part of Islamic education. This idea of Islamic education progresses right the way through the education system up into higher education, into university itself, when Muslims are encouraged to go and complete their education there both men and women, but within a moral framework. So ideally, a single-sex university would be preferred, and if that's not possible, then we often find that Muslim students will group together so that they can keep society with people who will live according to their kind of values, rather than being distracted and led astray by other kind of values within student life and society. We can see then finally this lifelong process. When children are small, one plays with them and shows them by example how to live a human life. When they grow older, one instructs and guides them in the principles of Islamic practice and knowledge. As they grow older still, the parent becomes the friend, the accompanier, the one who journeys alongside, and eventually one becomes the grandparent, the counsellor, the one who in turn is respected by the younger generation. And so we can see a tradition of passing on the wisdom down from one generation to the next. Join me next week when we'll be looking at the Islamic economic system. Don't forget that you can catch up on any episodes that you've missed on the On Demand section of the Ahl al Bayt website, and you can also download an article to go with each of these programs from my own website. I look forward to seeing you again.